This is Selma Schimmel for the group room at the 14th World Conference on Lung Cancer, WCLC, organized by the IASLC, the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer. We are in Amsterdam, and we're joined by our good friend, Professor Dr. Giorgio Scagliotti, who is the director of the Department of Clinical and Biological Sciences at the University of Torino, Italy. Hello, Professor Scagliotti. Morning. Professor Scagliotti, we understand now that the ability to detect mutations that drive the development of lung cancer is really changing the whole landscape of therapies that are available that go and work in sync with these different mutations. Would you please explain some of that for us? Well, we are really uh, facing a sort of round, a roundabout uh, because uh, we, are, we are truly convinced, and this is something that was already uh, clearly uh, understood in the, in the preclinical setting, that any kind of cancer, it's, uh, it's a sort of uh, a genetic disease related to uh, genetic changes in, in, uh, in uh, in the genome uh, code. And let me say in a more broad way that uh, uh, cancer is a disease of the genome. And uh, in some patients, in some cases, this genome is starting to work less efficiently. And when it's working less efficiently, it's accumulating changes. And these changes are changes in uh, in the sequence in the genome, or, uh, or in other cases, there are pieces of the genome that are uh, translocated to another uh, area of the genome. And this is, is creating a set of changes that sometime, and in, in some diseases, and obviously this is different from one tumor type to another, is generating the critical environment for favoring the progression of the tumor, the expansion of the, of the cancer cells, and also the ability to, profil to proliferate of the cancer cells. This is the general concept behind these uh, uh, genomic changes that we call somatic mutation or translocation. Now, this is, all these changes are giving some, uh, some advantages to the cancer cells compared to the uh, normal cells, to the program, the, the normal functioning genome. And this is what, what I can tell you. So we have these kind of changes. These changes are uh, accumulating over time. We need a, a critical number of changes. This is something that was new already in the past in, in colon cancer uh, carcinogenesis and the pivotal work of Dr. Vogelstein, almost going back to 15, 20 years ago, told us exactly the sequence of these genomic changes in colorectal carcinogenesis. Now we know, we are starting to know that a set of gen genomic changes are also in place in lung cancer. This is mainly true for never smokers. That is, by the way, it's an important subgroup of patients with, with non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, we see a growing proportion of patients that are live smokers or never smokers with lung cancer. And this is telling you again that in this uh, subgroup of patients, probably there are some changes independently from the tobacco exposures that are going on because the genome is in some way fragile and is lending to this kind of uh, genomic changes. I would like just briefly address with you how much important it is uh, for the patient uh, to push the physician, to, put, to push the medical oncology uh, to uh, get uh, the full genotype of, uh, of uh, his or her tumor, uh, especially if you are a nerve smoker, especially if you are a live smoker, you have a relatively high chance to have a mutation. You and know, you raise a very good point, and I'm glad you raise it, because I think that what you just said is a hugely important message for the, for the viewer, the patient who's listening because they have an opportunity, it perhaps sometimes falls on them to be sure that that tissue is properly analyzed. And yeah. it's not like with some of the other cancers where you have a limited number of 
physician specialist involved. Lung cancer involves you, the medical oncologist. It involves the pulmonologist. It involves the thoracic surgeon. It involves the pathologist. The role of the pathologist in lung cancer must be just exploding. Yeah, having, having this, uh, this multidisciplinary approach in mind, uh, we should also recognize that in the last three, four years, it became every day more relevant to get enough tissue. So we need to explain to the patients that uh, probably the medical oncologist or the thoracic surgeon or the respiratory physician will ask to the patient for more invasive procedures. But the more invasive procedures are not uh, necessarily associated with uh, an increased amount of, uh, of uh, side effects. But this, uh, this uh, need for uh, a sufficient amount of tissue sometimes is, uh, is really the key. Because first of all, you need to do the histological diagnosis, but at the same time, at the, at the time of histological diagnosis, what we call the molecular pathologist will be also able to do additional analysis. Additional analysis that, in principle, uh, can, uh, can lend to a more specific uh, histotype definition, but at the same time, having the histotype definition and knowing that, at least at the moment, most of these genomic uh, changes are related to adenocarcinoma, we, you, we know uh, we can do additional genomic analysis to see at least if the tumor is carrying on uh, EGFR mutations or AL translocation or there is a KRAS mutation. At the moment, we don't have any, any drug available for KRAS mutation, but again, uh, medical oncology is, is a moving field, is a sort of evolving field. And what is not available today could be available one year from now. And it could be still of value for the, the current patients uh, because it could be that one year from now, we will, uh, we will get a, a new drug for, for KRAS, and they can receive in second, third, fourth line this kind Well, of it's thing. also the, the collective data. Yes. All right, now let's talk about what does it mean that we're investigating CMET inhibition? What is, in simple English, what is that? CMET is another pathway. It's one of the many pathways that are involved in some way uh, in, uh, in cell proliferation, in, in progression, in, uh, in the uh, generation of metastatic cascade. Well, CIMET is not new in the field of uh, preclinical research because uh, we, are, uh, we are already plenty of information. We know that there is uh, some gene amplification. The, the number of, of, the, of the copies of the, of the specific gene are increased uh, in one to seven percent of all the cases of non-small cell lung cancer. And the presence of this uh, amplification is associated with uh, a, a worse pro prognosis. But we know also that uh, CMET has a role in the generation of the metastatic uh, uh, process, as I said uh, to you uh, before. And we know also that uh, CMET amplification could be, and it is, a mechanism of resistance to um, EGFR TKIs in those patients that uh, they have an EGFR mutation, they were exposed to erlotinib or gefitinib, and they became in a second time resistant to these agents. In this uh, uh, group of patients, in 20% of the cases, uh, investigators uh, detected uh, as a mechanism of resistance a CMET amplification. So there is uh, a good uh, scientific rationale to add to erlotinib or to gefitinib uh, MET uh, inhibitors. And we have different MET inhibitors currently in clinical trials. Some of them are just in the phase two program. Others are proceeding in the, in the phase three program. We know, and we are currently evaluating in the context uh, of at least a couple of phase three clinical trials, this agent with the prospective collection of, of tissues and also investigating several biomarkers, including immunostochemistry for CMET, a gene copy number assessment. Every day that a lung cancer patient survives is one day closer to a new possibility as these drugs are still in clinical trials 
in the not too distant future, we will be able to see these drugs available to help many, many of these patients. Yes, but to get this, uh, this next day closer, you need, the, you need to put yourself on, uh, on a clinical study. That is the main exactly. message. Exactly, because and we encourage patients to get that second opinion at academic centers where these trials are going because it's really together that there's the paradigm shift in treatment. Uh, this is another important message that I would like to give to everyone. Uh, I believe that uh, we need to, real, to, to, to convince people that they can receive, let's say, the standard of care in the community. But when uh, uh, the, the clinical trial is becoming an option, uh, they should consider to, to move to a, a, an academic institution where there are several options and then there are physicians that are doing this kind of activities uh, all year around. Professor Scagliati, we have promising news in the area of maintenance therapy. First of all, what does maintenance therapy mean? Uh, the maintenance is uh, it's a relatively new approach. You know that uh, for, for systemic uh, treatment, the guidelines are recommending uh, the use of a platinum agent in combination with, uh, at, at le win with another compound that could be uh, Pemetrex at Fornum Squamous, as I showed in a, in, in, a in a large phase three clinical trials almost five years ago, or uh, for squamous histology with taxanes or with uh, vinorabine or gemcitabine. But uh, chemotherapy is still an option for the vast majority of our patients at frontline maintenance or second line. And after frontline, the current standard of care is to stop treatment, waiting for progression. Sometimes this, uh, this uh, a strategy is not working for, for, for the patient, it's not working for the physician, because when you are getting a, a good objective response, in other words, you are, you are getting a, a tumor shrinkage that is clinically relevant and radiologically relevant, you are, you are making yourself the question, is the time to stop uh, chemotherapy or not? So the reason of maintenance is coming out uh, from, uh, from this uh, question that I, I just made. And uh, maintenance is the possibility to go ahead with the systemic treatment beyond these four or six cycles, continuing with one single agent that could be either a biological agent or a cytotoxic agent up to progression. Now, if you, if you want to extend chemotherapy beyond these uh, four to six cycles, you need to have an agent like Pemetrex that is extremely tolerable and safe. And, and, and for our U, U.S. listeners, they know that as Olympta, because that, yes. that's the generic name you mentioned, right? Uh, and again, uh, the, 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 the Paramount study that has been presented a few weeks ago at ASCO, and, uh, the study has been updated with additional data at this meeting, is showing for the first time that if you are uh, giving cisplatin alimta as an induction treatment and then you are continuing with uh, alimta alone in the maintenance phase, you are getting an extension of your uh, uh, time to progression. So your, your prog the progression of the disease is, is, is coming later in, in, the, in the course of the disease. And we are waiting, obviously, uh, until the end of this year, the beginning of 2012, to get also mature overall survival data. If the, there will be also an overall survival improvement, I truly believe even if we need still to select the most appropriate patient, uh, continuing chemotherapy, continuing chemotherapy with, uh, with a single agent after an induction with cisplatin, epimetrix and inosquemous histology, may become an option. Professor Scagliati, thank you for making it so much easier for our viewers to understand these, this complex genomic area and also for taking time out to mention some of the other cancers that we don't hear so much about. These patients deserve time and attention too and we all appreciate that you just acknowledge that.
Professor Giorgio Scagliati, the Director of the Department of Clinical and Biological Sciences at the University of Torino in Italy, and you always make time for the group room, and thank you so very, very much. Thank you.